In this episode of the podcast, we are going to go into Andrew's recent back injury and a little bit of background into his previous back injury many years ago. And I think one of the bigger takeaways from this episode is probably going to be around the mindset. So, you know, we focus a lot on movement and that's a huge component of what we teach in our programs and also what you see on our social media. But this platform, podcasting, is going to be a great way for us to talk about the mindset behind a lot of the things that we teach uh, inside of our programs and what we feel is probably one of the more important components that contribute to pain. So. I hope that you get some awesome bits of information from this, and I have a feeling you'll resonate. Leave us a comment wherever you're listening or on Instagram somewhere. We stare at screens all day, and we really like to interact with you guys. We're in the same place every day. <laughs> Save us. Enjoy. Welcome to the Wealth Podcast, everyone. I'm Andrew Dettelbach, and this is... Katie Goss. And we took a pretty large hiatus. We did three episodes for this podcast, and then we had a bunch of things happen that just took our time away. And now we're back to working on the podcast. This time I'm producing it, and it's all new for me. So we'll see how this turns out in the long run. Let us know what we need to improve on for the next one. We're going to be talking about my back injuries. I think Katie's going to be doing like an interview type deal with me. We don't need to wear these. We can take them off. We're taking off our headphones. We're not talking to anybody. There's no sound coming through our speakers. We don't need those. Great. Uh, We're going to be going over my back issues Mm -hmm. that I've had, and you're going to be the... um, The interviewer. Interviewer. You are the interviewee. So... All right. To start off... Oh, we were going to talk about Element. Oh yeah, we, we don't have a sponsor for the podcast. We but made it's fun to mention something ourselves some elements at the beginning. The grapefruit flavor is my favorite by far. This is something that we've been using on a daily basis for more than a year now. I don't remember exactly when we started. Two years, two or three years, two or three years. Um, they have a bunch of flavors. They're great. What is it? It is an electrolyte mix that comes in a little packet. It is sodium, magnesium, potassium. And the flavors are awesome. It doesn't have a bunch of added junk in it like a lot of brands do. I'm very sensitive to additives and can't tolerate corn products, which are in almost everything. Most of the time, maltodextrin, things like that come from corn. Um, Doesn't have any of that. It is sweetened with stevia. And they also have one that is unflavored. So if you don't want the flavoring or if you're someone who doesn't tolerate stevia, they have an unflavored one. I don't like the unflavored one does the trick it tastes like chlorinated water so it's not my favorite (laughs) but the flavored ones are great we make popsicles with them the kids love them i feel way better about giving the kids a water bottle with element in it than giving them the gatorade that has i mean like red food coloring and corn syrup and a bunch of junk in it so so i don't know how this will work but you're gonna click the link link, below we can put a link below (laughs) and you can get a free gift with your purchase so if you want to try out element they will give you a free gift. I believe it is a sample pack of all the flavors. So if you choose one flavor, um, try it out, and then you get a sample pack for free with all of the flavors. And they have watermelon, raspberry, orange, citrus. All the fruits. Yeah. Grapefruit is seasonal. It's my favorite. They have a chocolate, chocolate mint. All right. Enough of them. Shall we? Let's get into the podcast. Uh, Okay. I would like to start with you talking about your original back injury. That was back in? 2013. And this is what a lot of people already know me for. We're going to talk about that injury. And then we're also going to talk about a more recent injury that I had that I haven't fully talked about. I shared about it on social media. I've shared about it in our communities for our program, but not in this format. So to start, what's it? I was going to say, I know that we've talked about the original injury a little bit on the previous podcasts that we did here. And I know that we've talked about them on a lot of podcasts that we've been guests on. A lot of them. So we don't need to go too deep into that, but just to give just a okay. brief background of what so occurred. I had a 10 millimeter disc herniation, disc, a disc herniation in my lower back, my L4, L5, if anyone cares to know the, the metrics there. And what that created for me was a lot of lower back pain as well as severe sciatica down both of my legs. And sciatica kind of feels like 
like an electrical fire kind of shooting down your legs all the way down to the feet. Um, and you can kind of feel the whole line going from the lower back down into your toes. And it was constant. Uh, it prevented me from standing upright. Every time I tried to straighten myself upright, I'd feel an extra pull. Uh, prevented me from sleeping well. I really wasn't able to focus on anything other than the pain that I was experiencing. And this lasted for two years. Um, I had multiple surgeons tell me I needed to have surgery. And physical therapists told me that, chiropractors told me that. And I knew from working in the clinic with people and from people in my family that once you have a surgery, you have a much higher likelihood of having another surgery because the surgery doesn't always solve the issue in a lot of cases that I had seen. It was too risky. It was like, yes, it might solve it. And also it might make it way worse and it may really prevent you from making improvements because of the scar tissue that's created. Scar tissue is one of the bigger issues that, um, you know, causes problems for people when it comes to surgery. And, um, I didn't want to go that route. So I took the, the conservative route of exploring. I started by taking a lot of medications. Um, not that that's conservative, but I was taking a lot of pain meds. Uh, I went through about a th thousand ibuprofen. I did end up getting a cortisone injection a few months after the injury. And that worked for a week. Ultimately, after the cortisone injection wore off, I was like, the pain meds are barely doing anything. I just stopped taking all the medications because I felt like there were a lot of other side effects that were occurring from taking all the, the tramadol and meloxicam and I don't I remember think the other ones. You did say though, right, that the, the one positive thing that you did get out of that injection was that you did have a very brief period of feeling better, which gave you just enough to, to kind of cling on to that and keep working. Yeah. It, I was like, Oh, this is what it feels like to not have pain. And during that time they told me, all right, don't move your back. Cause the more you move your back, the more you're going to squish the cortisone out of there and it's going to last, um, you know, it won't last as long. So I didn't move. I wore a back brace. I kept my spine like super neutral everywhere I went. And I didn't really live during that time still. But I didn't have pain. I was able to sleep, which was a huge win for me. And, um, you know, go to the bathroom and not have pain. That was awesome. But ultimately, it came back full force a week later. All the pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing had changed other than the fact that it was I knew what it was like to not have it. Um, go for it. So then you like fast forwarding a little bit, you got into making programs after you completely recovered, you started working with people in the clinic, then you started doing online programs, started helping people. And you felt great for how long? Seven years after, after that. So it was like 2013, 2015. I had sciatica and it was like, it got gradually better over those two years. It's not like it stayed the same the whole time, it got gradually better. About the two year mark, it was all gone. And I was able to do everything. Like I was doing lots of deadlifting, squatting. I was doing burpees. I did CrossFit during that, that whole time after my injury. CrossFit isn't what created the injury. Um, I didn't talk about that here, but the injury was just me not knowing what my body was doing and what I was doing in the gym. Uh, ultimately, like a cough is what, triggered the original injury, but that isn't the thing that caused it. Um, you know, there were a lot of other things that led up to that. But after that period of time, I was able to do everything and I got stronger and stronger, and stronger during that time. So during that time when you were healing, you said that the sciatica improved gradually mm -hmm. and consistently. Were there any times where it got worse or was it just a consistent yes. gradual improvement? Cool. I don't think I've ever talked about this. Um, yeah, I saw a gradual improvement and then there would be some stagnant points where like nothing would change for a month at a time. And then there would be some instances where it would flare up and it would get a lot worse. And that would be from like me trying to do some movements or exercises that would cause me to just lay up on the, you know, lay down on the floor. The sciatica would be 10 out of 10. It would be constant burning and it would last that way for a few days. And then it would kind of go back to where it was because I just continued to work on the exercises that I knew had originally helped it. So it was this, there was a bit of exploration. Like I, I was practicing with movements that I hadn't done in a while and it would kind of set things off and it's like, okay, do I need to avoid that movement? Maybe not. Maybe I need to modify 
like the depth or the number of repetitions or the number of sets that I had done or the difficulty, the time, whatever it was I was doing that caused the flare ups. At this point, I don't remember what, what they were. That was like nine years ago. No, seven, eight years ago. So I don't know what those specific movements were that caused the flare ups, but I remember there being like three or four of those. And even after even after the, it got better. So that after that two year period of time, I started CrossFit. There were a couple of times where my back would get really, really like tight and it would create a little bit of sciatic symptoms. And I'd get like super nervous and it would only last like a few days and I would just continue to get stronger. So there were always these little kind of like setbacks that would happen every like six to 12 months for a couple of years after it got better. But it, it never lasted long enough for me to really like dwell on it. And I just continued to get stronger and they, they got better faster each time too. That was going to be my question was how did you know that it was safe to continue doing what you were doing? And how did you not get trapped in being fearful that, you know, sometimes people will do something like CrossFit and then will have a flare up or a setback with their body, whatever joint issue problem they have. And, you know, they will take that as, well, I can't do CrossFit because it hurts me. So how did you navigate that and not let that scare you? Well, I knew that I was making improvements and it was the the CrossFit coach that I was with at the time really helped me overcome my initial problems that I had. And I had trust in, in him, first of all. So I had someone as a guide that could help me through this stuff. And um, he had no problem regressing things for me in the gym because, I, you know, CrossFit, you follow the written workouts and he would just regress things, you know, tell me what, what to change. But when I had the initial kind of flare up, of course, I had those like, oh, my God, like not again. Like, am I going to be doing this for another two years type of thing? But then really just having the, the awareness that I was starting to gain in my body and understanding that like the sensations I was feeling weren't the same. Uh, they were a lot more muscular and um, it wasn't so much like the disc because for me with my disc injury, I didn't necessarily have a, a lot of like back pain in the lower back. It was like any movements I did with my spine created pain down to my feet, but the lower back pain wasn't really there. Uh, if I, if I like really rounded my spine, I would feel like it kind of felt like a dagger right in the middle of my back. That's kind of what the disc felt like to me. But for the most part, I didn't have any lower back pain, but during these flow flare ups, I did, which told me that this was a different scenario and it was more off to the side. So I could feel it being like more muscular kind of spasms in a way, but Mm -hmm. not, not like I recently had. And, um, We'll get into that. And sometimes that, that tightness can create, like recreate some of the symptoms, especially if I still have or had a, a disc herniation or something like that. And having that tension down there could definitely recreate some of those static symptoms. So the root was a little bit different than, than it was originally. And it got better way faster. Like the next day I'd wake up feeling like way better. And then the next day I'd wake up feeling way better. So it just improved on its own really quickly each time. All right. So back to that period, you had a long period of time when you were feeling great. What were you doing during that time? We touched on that you had an online program. What? Yeah, I, I was working in the clinic with, with patients. So during the time of my injury and after I was working with people and kind of putting the things I was learning with my body to the test with other people's bodies and seeing those making improvements for people. And during that process, I discovered that I really had to focus on my entire body and not just my lower back. And the same went for everyone else in the clinic. And I, I take people through like what their feet were doing, what their shoulder blades are doing. You know, I can do all that, that crazy shoulder blade stuff. And, um, I hear Austin on his say bike. Say hi to our neighbor. If you hear a motorcycle, just say hello, Austin, in the comments, wherever you're listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's got me all flustered. <laughs> it may not even pick it up. So, what, what Working was, with patients in the clinic. Yeah, working with patients in the clinic. And, and realizing that, for me, I had to work on everything from the ground up to make a difference in my back. Because everything is, for lack of a better term connected. And when people would come in with shoulder pain or neck pain or foot pain, we would have to take them through the entire body because I noticed that like, okay, 
if I'm going to work with someone's shoulder, they're doing this shoulder stuff, but then their rib cage is moving around. I'm like, okay, well, I can't, I can't get their rib cage to stop moving around without focusing on the, the core positioning, the alignment there. And you can't do that without assessing the pelvis. And the pelvis is intimately impacted by the, the feet and the hip position and the, the hip strength and rotation. So it was like very natural that when we started working with someone, we just worked on the chain. So as I learned this, I was applying it to myself. And eventually we came to a point because we started to grow pretty massive social media following at the time. I'm like, I could take this method to an online you know, market. I could make it something because I'm doing the same things with people in person. People are like, I don't want a cookie cutter program. I'm like I'm giving you a cookie cutter program in person and you have no idea and it's working. So I took it online and it works there too. So despite not wanting a cookie cutter product program, some people thinking that they, they need something very specific to them, that isn't necessarily the case. I would do that with people in person and they had no idea. I was just giving them the same exact program. Um, and that became very successful. <laughs> we, we had about 20,000 people go through that program before I left that business. How was that, um, just on a side note, growing, growing the social media, how, how did that work? It, it was, um, how did it work? Well, we'd make content daily or sometimes we'd batch the content all in, all in one or two days for a couple weeks or two, two or three weeks. And, um, I would have to edit, write, post, do the comments and interact with the social media every single day of my life for, what was that? five, six years. And I continued to do that now. <laughs> so it's been, <laughs> That's it's been seven or eight years of me just being on social media. I was looking at my, I was talking to my mom today about like my insights on my, mm -hmm. on my, the iPhone. It tells you like how long you're in certain apps. And it's like, you've been on social media for seven and a half hours today. And like that, that's my average is about six and a half hours a day on social media. Mm -hmm. um, just communicating with people and, and whatnot. So GMs, comments. Yep. Posting. All right. So fast forwarding to this past June, do you want to fill in anything else during that time? Uh, I mean, well, I mean, I, during that time, like there were, there was like a five year period of, by Austin, uh, there was like a five year period of time where I didn't have any back issues, nothing. Like, you know, people would ask, is your back okay now? I'm like, yeah. Like, I deadlifted 455 pounds. Um, I was doing CrossFit competitions, you know, with ridiculous weights and ridiculous reps under incredible fatigue uh, all the time. And my back was awesome. And you also did have a diagnosis during that time. Yes, right? and you're the one that, that led that to me, yes. or <laughs> led me to that rather. Yeah. Uh, so I was diagnosed with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which we've talked about in previous podcasts, yeah. just gives me, I have super stretchy connective tissue and that doesn't just affect the joints, that also affects um, you know my eyes, my teeth, my gut, uh, my skin, um, not, not so much my nervous system, I don't think. But overall, I've experienced a lot of injuries mm -hmm. um, as a result of having that. And I, we're not going to talk about those, but I've had joints, joint injuries in every single joint in my body. And that has also helped me really figure out what things are most beneficial to do in terms of like isolated movements and what has helped me feel the best and helped other people feel the best. Great. All right. So fast forwarding back again to last June, which was what month are we in? September? September. It's a few months ago. Spring. June. What happened in June? Okay. So we did our last podcast in May and wow. it is September now. So yeah, okay. I, I was looking at when we did our last podcast. Right. And the reason is we wanted to get our podcasts kind of set up because we were launching a hypermobility program and I was going yes. full bore with that program. So during the months of April and May, we were filming, writing, editing, building the program for Hype Mobility, and I had that pretty much built out by like June first, I think. And when we when we go into program building mode, um, all of our other responsibilities don't go away, so it's just a lot more work. It's really long days. It's a lot of hours. Um, 
it's a pretty low quality of life for us when we're building new programs at this point in time because we don't have um, many employees. Yeah, and as a result, there's you know a little bit less sleep. There's a little bit less self care. Uh, I was still getting in a lot of my workouts, so basically, I'm getting, I'm sharing that there was a lot of stress during this yes. time. Um, and we were also planning to travel, you know, drive from North Carolina to Wisconsin in like the first or first or second week of June, and it was June third that. I went outside to do a little workout with my boy and we were making a, an obstacle course. And I had just, I warmed up my deadlift. I was doing 305 pounds for a few reps there and it was all great and felt awesome. And then I went over to my sandbag and picked that up, threw it over my shoulder, turned around, went to pick it up again. And I felt like 10 rips on the left side of my lower back. And, and I immediately dropped it. My back immediately seized up and like just clenched down and I couldn't, flex or extend my back at all, just completely locked up. And I was like, well, that <laughs> and this is Andrew made a highlight reel on his Instagram of this. I think you actually recorded the obstacle course that you guys had set up out there. So yes. There, there's some footage of that. You can look at the highlight reel on his Instagram page. It's at the dot shirtless dude. And you can see some video footage of this process and the stuff that we're going to continue to talk about a little bit here yeah and that was so having this injury and like i immediately was like okay maybe this is just a little tweak i'm like definitely doesn't feel like my si joint went out like i know what joints feel like when they get locked up you know it's a very sharp pain and um this was um, like a muscle season i uh, feeling the rips uh was a pretty clear indicator especially on one side that you know it's, it was either my paraspinals or my ql that that was kind of torn there. I had a strain in this in this instance, and um, I know what it's like to have a disc injury. I know I know what it's like to have a bulge and a herniation and to have sciatica, and I had none of that. Um, so you know, there were a lot of people that were asking me like, "How do you know that it's a muscle yeah. strain?" I don't. I'm, I know because I've had a lot of different types of back pain, a lot of different injuries throughout my body, and this feels muscular to me. And that that was like the clear indicator. So I came inside and I was like debating. I'm like, I'm the person that I've helped tens of thousands of people with their lower back injuries because I've overcome mine. And I've talked for years about how I haven't had any back injuries or back pain at all. And I had this like second guessing myself, like, who am I? Like, why, why do I feel like I have any authority to share anything when I I'm completely sidelined right now? I'm laying on the floor and what do I do? Do I share this with my following or do I just go dark for a few weeks? Like I'm embarrassed that I'm injured. Do I share this situation? And I ultimately was like, I need to just be authentic and be who I am. I've always been that way on my social media. So I shared about it and I was pretty re like reluctant to do it. And it was received very well. Um, and that kind of gave me like uh, some... I guess you could say like an ego boost in the sense that, okay, I'm doing the right thing here. And, and I, <laughs> I didn't share for a couple of days cause I was struggling and I'll talk about that in a second. After I shared that I had a back injury and that like, I'm going to get through this and like, you know, I'm going to adjust my expectations here. And mm -hmm. instead of working toward lifting heavy, like I was a week ago, I'm going to work toward like doing some rehab, really basic movements. That's my goal from, from here on until I feel good enough to start implementing new things again. And within, I think it was like five hours after the injury is when I had the first like super duper spasm. Yeah. And I think there were some other things occurring at the same time that was adding some stress for us. Um, yeah. You mentioned that we we had planned this trip to Wisconsin. We were going to drive to Wisconsin to visit my family, who we had not seen since before COVID, I think, mm -hmm. most of my family. Um, one of my brothers was flying in from out west and was going to be meeting up with us, and the cousins were going to be playing together. So the boys were really excited, really looking forward to this. We had been planning for this trip for a while. Um, and, um, 
my grandmother who I was very, very close to passed away during COVID and we were planning on spreading her ashes during that. And one of my cousins was getting married. So there was kind of a lot uh, involved with this trip that we had planned. And I also had an abscess tooth that <laughs> decided like a tooth that got an abscess infection. Um, and I had been in just a significant amount of pain and had been debating whether or not we could take this trip to Wisconsin. I was trying to get in to see an endodontist to get a root canal and had finally that day, I think it was after your, after you hurt your back, but you hadn't really told me that you really well, hurt your like, back. I was like, we're, we're going, we're going to Wisconsin. Yeah. He's like, like no problem. I'm fine. I'm fine. He came upstairs and you know, was walking and was, you know, said they hurt his back, but I'm fine. We can go. And I made the decision based off my tooth that we were not going to Wisconsin, that I needed to get in with the endodontist and get the root canal. I just was having such severe pain. And as I feel like it, it was, was like within 15 yeah, minutes, shortly after I made the decision and called my family and said that we were not going, um, he Andrew had just I was a walking through spasm. our kitchen here and I started I was like I'm I need to go to the restroom so I started walking to the restroom and I was like starting to hold on to things to move around like pretty intensely like I was pretty leaned over and like I was struggling to walk around all of a sudden and then I didn't have this one space here to hold on to things and I was already leaning forward and I think the combination of having the tear and just leaning forward caused it to go into super spasm and it spasmed for a good like 20 minutes straight. And I like fell to the floor, not because I lost control of my legs or anything, but because it hurt so damn much. And I, I've never experienced a lower back pain to that extent before. Um, and just completely dropped me to the floor, laying there and just screaming. The kids are looking at me like, what in the hell? Yeah, I, I, I told threw the kids out some to words. Go, go outside. I was like, he's okay. Go outside. Like, it was scary for them to see him in that much pain. Um, so I sent them outside to play and then assessed the situation. <laughs> and uh, we got out a chair and elevated his legs and tried to find a position that was comfortable for him to at least just sit and breathe. Cause I couldn't get it to stop spasming for that period yeah. of time till I got my legs up and was able to finally calm down. And then I think it took me like an hour to get from there to the, the couch that's right behind this camera here. And, um, <laughs> just, yeah. just because it would, it would continue to like re spasm. And that was for the first few days, that was like the thing that it wanted to do. And, um, we talked immediately about getting some muscle relaxers to, to get it to calm down because, you know, we're not fans of a lot of like medication and stuff like that when it's used without any, any plan in place, without, yeah. without any, like doing any work yourself. Like if you're just only taking medication, you're not doing exercise, you're not changing your diet, you're not getting better sleep. If you're not doing something to find a way to get off the medication, then I think medication is definitely a problem. But it is a tool, and I wanted to use it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we um, – let's see. When you were having the spasms, I opened up the couch, which pulls out into a bed, and actually threw some – I think threw some sheets on it. And we were finally able to get you up and onto the bed. And once I got there, I was there for 24 hours. Yeah. I did not, I did not get up yeah. from there. I had to stay in like one position. It would usually take me about five or 10 minutes to roll over if I needed to. Yeah. And um, it, it was just constantly spasming. I would like wiggle my foot and my back would start to spasm. I'd have to stop and like I would hold my breath and that only makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. all the things that I know about pain and injury, I was like really having to put it to practice right then yep. and there. Because again, I've injured a lot of things. This is like the one super acute spasm that I've, that I've experienced that was like, I'm fucked. Yeah. I can't do pelvic tilts. I can't do any movements with my body right now. I just need to completely rest. So we called our doctor who, um, we see remotely and he's great. And he ordered, you know, asked us all the, the typical Dr. questions. Danny or Cuyo. Yep. Asked us uh, all the typical questions to just make sure that, it, you know, there wasn't something more serious going on. And then he ordered the muscle relaxer. 
Um, unfortunately, this was evening by the time this was taking place and the pharmacy closed before I could get there and pick up the muscle relaxer. And the city we live in is not huge. And we found out that night that there are no 24-hour pharmacies in this entire area. Which I don't know much about. That doesn't, I'm like. That's crazy to me. <laughs> That's crazy to me. I've never, I don't think I've ever lived anywhere where there hasn't been a, a 24-hour pharmacy. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we were not able to get the muscle relaxer that night. Um, so we relied heavily on, I think, was it the heating pad that was helpful? Heating um, pad. And I'm pretty sure we, I took, we just maxed I alternated you out on... ibuprofen and Tylenol. Yep. Um, which didn't stop the spasms, but it reduced the amount of like pain, like the heat and mm -hmm. throbbing that was occurring in the lower back. And so during this time, I, I had obviously the thoughts of like, oh my gosh, you know, I have a pretty significant injury right now. And at the same time, I also know what I need to do. So I didn't really have that dark of a I get like a, the super negative mindset, like, oh man, I'm screwed for life. Like I'm, you know, I'm never going to be able to do the things I want to do again. I didn't ever really go that route. I immediately kind of went toward, these are the things I need to do. I need to rest. It's an acute injury. I know that I need to rest and I need to set aside all of my expectations for, for fitness and like all the things that I do, like I'm not going to be lifting heavy. I'm not going to be doing crazy exercises. Um, you know, I don't know how long this will take, but it'll be an important journey. And because I'd already decided to share it with social media, that was very helpful for me to be like, I'm just going to show how this can be overcome in, you know, a more positive mindset, you know, a maybe faster way. I'm not sure how you would gauge if it could be done faster or not, because it's just me doing it. I'd have to re-injure myself the same way to find out. Um, so what was going through your mind? Because I know that there were some points where you were pretty upset. Yeah. So I there were a couple of points where I cried and I'm just like, it hurts. Like I can't move. Yeah. I ended up peeing in bottles for like 36 hours there because I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. I wouldn't, I couldn't get to the restroom. And um, I was just frustrated that like I was completely sideline like I couldn't do anything and I often thought about people that were alone mm -hmm. I was like I have Katie I have the boys that can like get me things and do things take care of me but I'm like I can't imagine being alone in this situation and at the same time it made me wonder if I was alone would it help me get better faster or would it make this take longer because it would force me to have to move and like do something for myself um Whereas, you know, in a way you enabled me a little bit those yeah. first few days until she was like, you need to get your ass up. I went into, I mean, <laughs> I just went right back into nurse mode. Like I had out my notepad and I was writing down doses of Tylenol and ibuprofen and timing and, you so know, getting him set that. up with everything that he needed. I mean, if I had a call light, I would have given him a call light. But like he had like the <laughs> urinal and like all the things that he needed. And it was like that for... A couple, you know, a couple of days where I was, you know, making meals and helping you, you know, get clean yep. clothes on and get washed up and brush your teeth. Because, I mean, you weren't getting out of bed at all for, a, I think, like two days. The second day I was doing some exercises in the bed, like I was doing yep. some pelvic tilts. I got onto all fours and like just transitioning from being on my back to onto all fours took about an hour. Mm -hmm. And because any little like excessive movement. It wasn't to the point where like I'd move my ankle and I was going to spasm. That kind of went away pretty quickly within a, within a day. But like any bigger movement, um, even just trying to like lift my torso off the bed would set my back off into a spasm. So I had to move very slowly. I had to breathe the whole time. And it was just this like my arms were so tired, just like taking all the load and like pushing my body into these positions. Because when it did spasm, I would I would be just like just wrenched mm -hmm. up it would tighten up so hard and um you would just sweat and your I'd be, whole yeah, body my would whole body get... would sweat and tense and like i would be stuck there for another five or ten minutes which kind of slowed things down mm -hmm. and i probably had maybe 10 to 15 of those spasms in that first four days 
even with the, the muscle relaxers, they, they reduced the length of the spasm. The, the, intensity the intensity was intensity. reduced, but they didn't stop them from occurring. Um, but I was grateful that it, it stopped the intensity because it was pretty gnarly. And um, then on day three, you know, you would talk to some people and I was kind of just getting more dependent on like, you know, people bring me things. I think you were... It wasn't like I was sitting there being like, yes, I have slaves. It was, <laughs> it was just like... <laughs> yeah. You, I think you were stuck on the couch. And so I think you were. Oh, yeah. I started playing games on my phone and like I was, uh, you know, watching TV and like just being the potato. So I think after a few days of that and me taking care of the kids and taking care of you and, and seeing that you were able to, at that point, we had gotten you up, we'd used chairs, almost like a walker, we'd gotten you into the bathroom, like you were able to do some things. Yeah. And I think it was at that point that I kind of... When Katie was like, all right, you're being a little bitch. <laughs> I didn't say that. She didn't say that, but she said that. Um, <laughs> so I... Yeah, give you a little kick. So I got up and... Uh... I started walking a bit more. Like I started making goals of, all right, I'm going to walk for five minutes. So I'd get up with my walker. Katie put the towels under the chair here and I'd walk with that for five minutes. And it would get really tired after that five minutes. And I'd wait another like hour and a half or so. And I'd get up and I'd try eight minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. By the end of the day, I did like a 30 minute back and forth walk. And then it made pretty drastic improvement going forward from there which was kind of cool. Cause it's like, could I have gotten up on day two and started doing that stuff? I don't know. Maybe would it have gotten things done faster? Maybe, but it was nice to just give it that period of rest. So that's where I'm kind of, I think about the people that are alone. I'm like, would they have had the opportunity to rest during that period or would they have improved faster because they'd gotten their body moving faster? Cause you, like you have to, you can't just defecate in the bed. Like that was my deciding factor. Like I need to get up because otherwise I'm going to poop in the bed. And that that. that was actually a conversation that we had to (laughs) have of like, if you try to get up and you can't, you know, then you have to let me be the nurse. (laughs) (laughs) So those are, and I was like, I was too stubborn. So I found a way to get to the bathroom. It took about 45 minutes. (laughs) And, um, and you know, so I, I still think about like, it was great to have those two days of rest and then to start moving on day three by day four, I had probably made a 50% improvement and it was still hurting a lot. Like it would still spasm here and there, but I think my spasm, I probably had one spasm that day and I was walking more. I probably walked for a total of two or three hours that day. And then day five was like, I was, I was rocking. I didn't need to use, I was walking around with the, the stick mobility sticks too. I totally forgot that. I had to use the stick mobility sticks and they're, they were great because they have like grip on the top and the bottom. So I would set the stick mobility sticks at different angles to help like lift me up. And then, you know, I, I, I got real crafty with it in terms of like getting up out of bed and getting off off and on the toilet and moving around the house and stuff like that. And I'm super grateful I had those, not the intended use for what they're, what they're meant for, uh, but they were awesome. What day, And I got to just get rid of those sticks, you know, on like day five or six. What day did you go upstairs? I can't remember how long it was before you showered. Four. Like day four. It was four. I, I stayed down here for three days. But I was in the gym doing workouts on the following Monday. So I injured myself on Monday and I was back in the gym on Monday doing very light movements and walking around and like doing some light farmer carries and I was on the bike. And then Tuesday, I was like, wow, my back feels way better going through it, doing stuff. How light? Like, I want to give people perspective. So you have the farmer carries. What do you normally do for farmer carries? For the farmer carries, I normally do anywhere from the 50 to the 88 pound you know, or, you know, if I have access to something heavier than maybe the 150 pound carries. So what were you doing at that point when you were five, five pounds, five and 10 pounds Just to put it into perspective? So I started, you know, super light for, for me and for other people that might be one pound, two pounds. Like I obviously lift a lot of weight and I was doing what, what is that? 5%, 10% on my max. Um, 
And then I think that following week, I just made huge improvements. And it was like two weeks, I was just rocking. I was back to lifting. I was doing 185 pounds on my lunges within three weeks of my injury. And there was another travel situation coming up. Yes. So I think before we move further, there's a lot of like mind stuff going on here. So we alluded to the amount of stress involved in, in June, um, you know, leading up to June, we were launching a program in June. Um, that was like around the time that I was starting to lift weights again. After my injury, we launched our hypermobility program and we had some travel coming up. We also had one of our partners tell us that he needed to move on and that we were having to go through a repurchase agreement and just absorbing a lot of extra work, his tasks and stuff that we we needed to do, including the podcast. Which is why we haven't had one. (laughs) (laughs) And um, so we had program launch, um, you know, change of ownership. We had travel coming up and those three things were all happening at the same time. And a week before, so we were going to travel and like, is that the first week of July? Uh, I think second the, week. Yeah, second second week, of July. week of July. The week before, so literally two days after we, we were told that there would be a change of ownership, um, two days after my back just went haywire. I was doing, what, what was I doing? Like, it was like a single leg bridge or something. I was doing single, yeah. like warming up downstairs. I was doing like some single yeah. leg bridges. My back felt a little bit tight that morning. I woke up and I'm like, wow, my back hasn't felt this tight in, in a couple of weeks since, since I'd injured it a couple of weeks ago. And I went downstairs and was like, I'm going to do some just light movement today. And I was doing a single leg bridge, did some light hinges. And I went down to do the single leg bridge again. And my back just went, eh. it's like, screw you, bud. <laughs> and um, it seized up on the other side. So it wasn't oh, the left side. Cool. It was the other side that started tweaking out. This was a week before we were supposed to travel. You know, traveling from the East Coast to California, it takes a couple flights and it usually takes about 12 to 15 hours to get to your destination between like packing, driving, flying, you know, sitting in the airport, flying again, driving again. And yeah, it was. Yeah, where we live, you either have to take two flights to get anywhere pretty much, or you have to drive a couple of hours and then you can fly direct. So I think, yeah, we had a we direct drove. flight out of Charlotte. So we had to drive a couple hours to Charlotte and then Flew fly. into LAX and then drive another hour and a half to the next destination. Yep. So it was a lot of travel and it was the week before. And I was like, oh, this, this doesn't feel too bad. Like my back is tight. It feels annoyed and pissed off and it's like hurting a lot. But it's not too bad. And then every day that it got closer to the travel date, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. Nothing that I was doing was helping it. It was there was I was getting more and more anxiety about the fact that I'd be sitting and traveling and I wouldn't have, you know, the comfort of my home to like be there. And I'd have to sit in like really uncomfortable positions for a long period of time. And it just kept ruminating my mind. And I was like, oh, man, we were I wasn't concerned about like not I wasn't thinking about the future. I was just thinking like not far in the future. I was just thinking about my travel day. And we reached out to some friends. We had some someone came and gave me a massage and it felt great. And uh, her name is Katie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and <laughs> And I woke up the next day. I was like, wow, I'm feeling great. And I went for a little walk and I was just kind of walking up and down the hill. I'm like, yeah, this feels good. Oh, no, this wasn't it. That that wasn't it. But that was a different time. Anyways, I tweaked it again, doing super basic exercise. Really basic. Like like, uh, I was laying on the floor, just kind of like lifting lifting my leg. Just tweaked it out again. I started freaking out some more. And we finally got referred to a physical therapist down the street, Dan Carmack. I think it's Dan Carmack. Whip that out of my... For some dry needling. We'd had, you know, multiple people at this point were weighing in. A lot of people were sending messages. You know, people had been following along um, on social media. It's a slurp in that Sorry element. Sorry about that slurp. <laughs> Um, people have been following along on social media and, you know, a lot of people had said that dry needling was super helpful and it's not something that Andrew had ever tried before. So we went and saw this guy for some dry needling because we were getting to the point where the trip was 
in a couple of days. You know, we had reservations at hotels and flights and things that, you know, if we were going to cancel the trip, we needed to do it at that point or we were going to lose, you know, a bunch of money. So um, there's a lot of a lot of stress, a lot of pressure at that point to decide, are we going to do this or not? Do you feel good enough to do this or not? So went and did the dry needling. And it was wild. Like dry needling is, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of that now, at least for muscle uh, spasms like that may be acute. I don't know about chronic stuff. I haven't tried it for that, but, um, something acute like that, it made a massive difference. I woke up the next day going from like a 10 out of 10 pain to like a one. And I was like, Whoa. And I, I wasn't going to push it. He gave me a few exercises to work on. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do those. I'm super diligent with that stuff and did those exercises and was just feeling great. I went, I'm like, I'm going to go for a walk. And I was walking <laughs> down our hill and some neighbors walked by and I'm like, hi. And I just like breathed in my spit and just choked and just coughed. And that cough absolutely blew my back up. Just completely like re-spasmed it. And I called him and he's like, I don't usually do dry needling two days in a row, but we'd already talked about it. And uh, so I, I went back in a few minutes later. He did it. It helped, but it wasn't like the first time. But I could definitely feel the improvements from it again. And uh, the next day was travel day. <laughs> so I want to pause because I want to go over a couple of things. First of all, you know, when it comes to passive treatments, sometimes we will speak n negatively about the passive treatments most and time. most of the time. And I think it's important to outline your thoughts about that or for you to share. Yeah. So just like I talked about with the medication, mm -hmm. it really comes down to what is the plan to get you to do the work and for you to make the change because you want to use the passive treatments as a tool. You want to use the medications, any, any quick fixes you want to use as a tool to get you back to doing the things that are going to make the lasting changes, which is going to be your sleep, your diet, the movements and activity, the exercises, whatever it is you're doing to just move around, getting that done. Um, the relationships around you, the, the support structure, you know, how much sun you're getting, your, you know, all, all of these things make a difference. But if all you're utilizing is quick fix treatments, you're hopping from one provider to the, ne to the next, you're using like massage guns and um, cold packs, heat packs, whatever other ridiculous products uh, China pushes out at us, those little... We get back oh brace God. things and like the the <laughs> knee, braces. power knees with like you put springs behind your knees so your knees don't have to work as hard. Like just all these things people will buy. Is this a good thing? I'm like, no. The good thing is you putting in the work to make the change in the long run. Like you can use these things as um, you know, something in the short term, but to get you to do that stuff, but they're not going to be an end all solution. Uh, so utilizing the dry needling and the, the PT was an opportunity to get back to doing things I needed to do in this case, to be able to make it through travel so that I could get back to doing things I need to do. I also think it's important to note that, you know, even professionals need professionals. Like a lot of people have heard coaches need coaches, coaches. Need coaches. doctors have doctors like you, you still benefit from having someone else um, view your situation through a different lens a lot of times. Uh, I would say most things we tend to navigate on our own and do great yep. with, but with something more acute and with a lot more riding on it with this trip pending. And, you know, I think it can be really, really helpful to get some outside help um, as long as it's someone that you know is good and that you really trust them. Uh, we also got on the phone with um, – a doctor who we have worked with and um, she sent us a lot of people. Yeah. She sent us a lot of her patients over the years. Uh, you know, we were able to get on and just chat with her and talk through what was going on with him. And, you know, she was able to line us up with some people who could dry, do dry needling once we got to California, if we did need that. Yeah. So it was helpful to just have a plan in place. She and also prescribed a steroid. Yeah, just in Which case. I was if like, we I'm not it. taking a steroid. I've taken steroids in the past, and I'm like, I do not want to take it. But to have it, just in it, case, it was can like the be, nuclear bomb that I had available. It's just you know, like uh, even just for a peace of mind or level, you know, a little bit of comfort. And <clears throat> um, okay, so going back to it was travel day. 
So we had all of this. What stuff. did we? Yeah, we actually we brought an extra suitcase. We had a carry on suitcase um, that we had, you know, some snacks. We like to bring, we like food, snacks, and things with us. But we also had a set of resistance bands, a gorgeous ball, a like a beach blanket to lay down on the airport floor. Yep. Um, which, by the way, when we picked that up, it was like incredibly they, filthy. The, the floor looks clean. It is not. That is the kind of carpeting to have. Whatever they chose in the airport, like it looked clean. We laid the, the blanket down. He did some exercises, and when I picked it up, it was covered in crap. It was crazy. Um, but we had that. We packed the power dot. We had massage balls. That was the power dot was helpful um, on the plane. Yep. Because you're stuck in the position. I'm six foot five. So anywhere on the plane sucks. We used to fly first class a lot because we had, um, we flew a lot and we had the max tier or whatever. And they just put us in first class all the time. Even that sucks. And so just having something like turn on the muscles really helped to like get some blood flow to the area and like calm Mm -hmm. things down. Uh, I, you know, I took some medication before and on the plane. Yeah, we timed the, you know, Motrin and Tylenol and muscle relaxer. Um, we also brought, you know, a little pillow. Like We had a lot of tools at our disposal. And on the drive to Charlotte, we made a stop so that you could get out and walk around a little bit. When we got to the airport, at that point, wasn't lying down still the one position that you felt lying down was the, the only position that I could like not feel any pain, just lay there and be like, all right, great. So it would give me some, it would like reset me and then I'd get up and then like within 30 minutes, it would really like ramp up and like, I was really hard to move around and walk and stuff like that. Um, obviously on the plane, that was just, wasn't going to be something I could do. There's too many people walking up and down the aisles for me to just lay there. I can't. That's right. Yeah. So we boarded the plane so we got there, we got to the airport, you laid down right until we got, we were like the last people to board. Um, we tried to minimize, you know, the amount of time that we'd be stuck on the plane. So we boarded the plane and the kids and I sat on one side of the aisle, you sat on the other. So you were, you know, kind I didn't of have anyone calm. next to me either. That was awesome. Yeah, you didn't have anyone <laughs> next to you. But then what happened? I don't remember. Oh, well, they... I think there was lightning or something. So they, we couldn't take off. Oh so yeah. We were, we were just stuck, stuck on the tarmac for an extra like hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and they kept saying we should be taking off any minute. And it was like an hour and a half before we could even taxi and take off. So it added to our flight that was already almost four five and a half hours. hours. It was like six to seven hours, something like that. Yeah. Um, this is the crazy part. So I'm going to fast forward, like the flight itself, it hurt and it was, it was whatever, but About an hour before we landed, my back just completely started to release. And it was like, everything started to calm the hell down. And we landed and, you know, going from sitting to standing had been incredibly difficult. Like it would usually take me a couple minutes to sit, stand and move around. And like, even on the plane, when I'd use the restroom, it took a lot of like time. And like, I had to hold on to stuff to stand back up. And when we landed in LAX and I stood up, I was like, I just stood up and it hurt, but I just like, I was able to stand up and I felt like way better. And then I was walking, my strides were bigger and we got to the rental car place and I was like, I'm doing all right all of a sudden. And I got in the car and like getting, getting into cars is tough because like the flexion of my spine and everything is really painful to get into cars. They're tiny. Everything's tiny for me. And, um, including you and when i was getting to my mom's house i was just like wow i feel awesome and then went to sleep on an air mattress and that would have wrecked me and i woke up the next morning and i had like no pain everything was gone we went through our entire trip and i had no issues with my back i did the exercises still that i needed to do there was a little bit of like stuff there here and there but i was like running on the beach and i was out in the water and like doing everything that I wanted to do on the trip. And we had, you know, leading up to the trip, we had done a lot of planning around your back situation. Like we took the kids to a San Diego Padres game. And when we were choosing tickets, we chose tickets that were on the end of an aisle at the stadium at the top so that he could get up 
and like, if he needed to get move up around. and stand or move that we weren't like crawling over people or inconveniencing people. So we did a lot of planning around your back leading up to it and then it ended up being totally fine. Totally fine. We like, we even planned to go to the San Diego zoo and like, that's for anyone that knows if you're standing around at a, like any type of amusement park, you're standing for at least eight hours that day and it was fine. And Katie's writing me a note. She says she needs to use the restroom. Drink a lot of <laughs> element and a lot of water. So um, we we made it through that trip and it was totally fine until the day before we were flying back, the same thing happened. I went through the exact same sensations in my back that I had prior to coming out to California. You can go ahead. You go, keep go. talking about that. So I... I, literally all of the same things, any movements that I did, going from sitting to standing, I was having to take the medications again to calm it down, which d didn't do too much. And during <laughs> during the flight, like all the stuff, everything hurt going all the way back into the plane. We did all the same stuff and I was struggling all over again and got on the flight about an hour before we landed out here in, um, where am I? North Carolina everything started to feel better again. And I was able to get into the car and drive back here. Didn't have to stop. was feeling all right. Got into the house, woke up the next morning and my back felt totally fine. And I think this really was a fun little experiment of how much the mind can play a role with our pain. And our, on social media, we talk constantly about the exercises that we do and like here's all the exercises you should do but what we don't often talk about is the amount that our mind and our nervous system plays a role in our pain and we talk about this a lot in our communities we do lots of coaching calls about the mindset actually pretty much all of our coaching calls are about mindset and how the mind plays a role in your pain as well as other factors involved in your life aside from the movement because our entire program is about movement most of it is I'd say about 75% of our programs are movement based. And this situation really highlights how much the mind can fuck with you. Like it absolutely, uh, by the, by the second time, like flying back and I, it, the fact that it started hurting right before we flew again, it was like, dude, and I haven't had any issues since then. Since we got back from California, I've had no problems. I've gradually increased my weight. I've back to doing heavy squats and deadlifts and doing all my things. I, mean, I think my squats almost to where it was previously before my injury. I haven't pushed my deadlift that heavy. Um, have there been any points? Have you had any, any flare up? Like anything? I haven't had Nothing. any flare ups since, okay. since we got back from uh, California and it's just insane how much like the, the pain increasing up to the flight to California. And then the fact that it happened again, as I was flying back, there was a lot of stress for me around mm -hmm. flying and just the, tr the travel days. If it was just a quick flight, like our airport's 15 minutes away and it just went straight to the destination, that would have been fine. But the fact that we had to add another yeah. two, no, no, three and a half hours of driving on top of like sitting around at airports and stuff was a lot of stress for me. And I... <laughs> In our communities, we have people talk about how they have flare-ups from time to time. You know, sometimes their shoulder starts hurting again, their neck, their lower back. We have most of the people in our programs are come in with lower back issues. And they talk, they're like, yeah, my back just started hurting again. I was doing so great. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, I was doing all these, blah, 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 all these things. And I'm like, all right, what else is going on in your life? Well, my dog just died or uh, I just got a new job or I just lost my job. I, I'm moving. I'm going through a divorce. I just had a kid. Like there's all of these things that can contribute to our pain aside from how we move. And it's really common for us to focus on the movements because we can, con we can control movements. It's easier to be like, all right, what exercises do I need to do? I can control doing exercises. It's something that we have control over. But when it comes to our stressors and our anxieties, like the, sometimes those are things that we don't necessarily want to confront or that we even know that we need to confront. And um, those are the things that I see often contribute to people having pain. It isn't always just movement patterns. Yeah, we know that it's, you know, pain and especially chronic pain is multifactorial. There's a lot of things that contribute to it. And there are a lot of things that, <laughs> just 
slurping. slurping. A lot of things that you can improve upon. And I do agree and find that, you know, with our programs, we touch on sleep, how to maximize your sleep quantity, quality, you know, all the little hacks and tips and things that you can do for that. We focus on nutrition and all the things that you can do for that. We focus on your environment and your relationships. And we focus on the mindset. And I think that the mindset seems to be the thing and our thought patterns seem to be the thing that people oftentimes are the most resistant to and also that yields the biggest improvements. Yes, the movements matter. The strengthening absolutely matters. But I think it's all of those other things are external stuff, right? Like you can lower the temperature in your bedroom. You can avoid blue lights at night. You can eat healthier. Mm -hmm. But changing your thought patterns and, and beginning to control a little bit um, the things that you do with your mind it seems to be really challenging. And for some people, it's something that they've just never, it's very foreign to them. It's something that they've just never experienced or done. Yeah. And I think our community asked like what, when I talked about this, this story in our community, they asked what, like, what would you have done to like prevent that from happening? Like the, the stress around traveling and how things got worse. And the answer is, I don't, I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. What I, all I can do is, you know, I can't anticipate when things are just going to go haywire. Like that's, you know, I can do all kinds of meditation and self work and then all these other things to help mitigate stress and anxiety. But when the shit hits the fan, it hits the fan. And then what you do moving forward is what matters. And for me, it's like my, my mindset around each of these situations isn't like all doom and gloom. It's just like, okay, what are the steps that I can control in this situation? What are the things I can do moving forward? And, um, you know, adjusting my expectations because a lot of people get stuck in their their expectations of like, I, I want to be able to run a marathon in six months or I want to be able to, you know, lift this heavy weight or continue to do jujitsu jiu or, you know, I want to be able to lift my kids. And ultimately, you just need to be able to drop those expectations and make them more reasonable. And that's what I did and with my original injury. It's like, all right, my goal this week is to get up and go to the bathroom on my own. Like that is, it's not to squat heavy. It's to be able to get to the restroom. Uh, it's to be able to walk for an hour straight. It's to be able to, um, you know, do one squat, you know, with assistance. It's, you know, just shifting the goals. And that's what I had to do each day during this, this injury is I'd have to uh, adjust it to the, point where it's challenging me, but not so much that it's unattainable. And that's what people get so frustrated with is when they have these goals of squatting heavy, when they're completely sidelined, and it's an unattainable goal at that moment, and they get depressed, they get sad, they're crying, they, they come to us, they feel defeated. And you just have to drop those expectations down. And it can be really hard to do that even. But it's, it's important to recognize that doing that is going to allow you to get to that ultimate goal in the long run. What about other people's expectations? Like I know when, well, oh, when like you your... were, well, mine or the kids, I know when we had to cancel the trip to Wisconsin, both of us had a hard time with that because we were really worried about the kids and their expectations and disappointing them. And the same thing happened again when we were facing the a similar with situation with California and feeling like we can't cancel we already canceled the Wisconsin trip. We can't cancel the other trip for them. They were so excited about going yeah, to the baseball so, game. I mean, I for for California, we we went like, you know, I was struggling that day, and we went anyways. And that's but I just, just think for other people, I feel like a lot of times you take on a lot of guilt. Like, I remember you getting pretty frustrated at a few well, points. I do. I don't know if everyone couldn't. does. <laughs> I think a lot of people do. I think especially you know, for parents, but even people who don't have kids, even if it isn't parenting guilt, it's like your family is expecting you to come visit or your mm -hmm. friends are expecting you to come to this event. And maybe you can't because of your pain or your injury. And, you know, how do you manage that? How do you, how do you deal with that without letting it make things worse for you? Well, you know, in when we did landmark forum back in the day, there was a lot of like, because I, I was a huge, I'm still a people pleaser, obviously, but I was much more so back, you know, when I was 
around, around the time my, my injury, actually my original, original injury to 2013, like before that I was much more of a people pleaser. And I think there, there is some training here. Like you have to recognize that like you are not in control of other people's feelings and you're not in control of other people's expectations and you can't, you can't take that on. Um, I'm not 100% good at that. Like, obviously we went, like I thought about the kids. I thought about my, my mom stuff like that. But at the same time, if I literally wasn't able to get in the car to go there, I wouldn't have had so much of a burden that I, that I would have had a long time ago in my life. Still, I would have felt it, but I can manage it better just with that, that training that we had through, Mm -hmm. through the two years of the forum. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I, it's not like something I've overcome. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't don't know know if there's a really clear answer. I know it's just something that we, we hear over and over in the community as well. Um, And I think it can be really difficult as a parent specifically when you're dealing with an injury or chronic pain, you know, you, you end up feeling a lot of guilt for the things that you can't do with your kids Mm -hmm. or for the way that you're showing up for them. Maybe it's not what you envisioned for yourself for anyone who's had, you know, a serious disc injury or joint injury or something like that, that they've had to navigate and you've had to kind of be on the sidelines for a while. I mean, you talk about adjusting your expectations, you know, but when you're not able to pick your kids up or go outside and play with your kids, I think that it can add a lot of guilt and stress and can sometimes amplify some of the anxiety and some of the pain. Um, And I, you know, I don't have a, a really good solution or answer other than I think it is really important to be able to show your kids real life. And I think when you were injured, we spent a lot of time talking with the kids about, you know, how we were also disappointed and talking to them about Mm. their feelings of disappointment about not taking the trip to Wisconsin and also explaining to them, you know, when you're sick, who takes care of you, you know, mom and Andrew take care of you when you're sick. And now this is your chance to, you know, show Andrew that you care about him and help him. And, you know, you can fill up a water bottle, you can do, do things. And, you know, I think sometimes we shield our kids from a lot of reality. And I think, you know, anytime that you're in a situation where there is disappointment or there is, you know, an injury or, you know, a health condition or something occurring, you know, it's a good time to, to talk about those things with your kids and talk about the feelings surrounding it and how, you know, people have injuries and then they heal and then they get better. Cause Mm -hmm. I think for them, it was pretty crazy to see you who in their mind, you're like the incredible Hulk, like just so strong. And, you know, you're always throwing them around and playing with them and stuff. And then seeing you completely sidelined to the point that you couldn't even, you know, get up and brush your teeth or go to the bathroom was a huge adjustment for them. Like that was kind of shocking for them to see. And I, I just think it's a good opportunity to just be really transparent and authentic and, you know, reassure them that you're going to heal and you're going to be okay, but it also teaches them resiliency, you know? Totally. Yeah. I think that would probably be the the big thing is just being transparent with the people that are, that have those expectations and those upsets around you're not being able to yeah i guess do I, things. It's like, I say kids but sometimes it's grown adults I mean, that that, you're that's the thing is, <laughs> we were doing I, i'm coach assistant coaching soccer right now and uh they had me do like the, the motivational speech before and during a halftime and then like after they lost the game and the other coaches like you're really good at this i'm like i do this with adults they're no different <laughs> Adults are exactly the same as kids. Kids just have a little bit less of a filter sometimes. I don't know. The adults just don't get the snacks afterward. Well, <laughs> usually it's like beer or brewery yeah, or something. They get the snacks. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys have any questions about any of this, feel free to leave them in the comments. Is there anything else that you want to touch on? I I think that was uh, – hopefully that – answers some people's questions and gives you some, I guess, some peace of mind knowing that like, you know, I didn't want to share about this stuff, but you know, if it's, if it's beneficial to you to hear that, like, you know, I'm, I'm this dude on social media that posts, I I try to post um, 
my my setbacks, my struggles and stuff like that. I'm trying to be as, as authentic as possible, but hopefully it just gives you uh, insight into like what probably a real social media influencer might look like. Uh, I know a lot of people that just kind of post the things that look the best because, you know, that, that's a good ego boost. And it also gets a lot of traction. Um, people like to see people be like a, a superhero. And I just, th- I hope it's, in, I think it's important rather that we kind of display that we are human beings and that, you know, we're all on social media right now. And it can be very unhealthy to see unrealistic lifestyles out there. Like, I think I'm just going to throw this out there. Someone like people at this point know Liver King. I think of, I think of Liver King and I look at his stuff and everything's always positive, just hyper positive. I'm like, there's no problems in this guy's life. That is not true. There has to be something in his life that isn't just hunky dory positive all the time. I don't know what that is. And it's not up for me to like figure out what that is, but I just know that everyone's got something going on. And I think it creates this illusion of like, this is a perfect human being. I want to be like that. So I need to do what Mm -hmm. he's doing. But what you're missing are all the things that he's struggling with. And that is probably the more important stuff that people need to see is like, yes, you can still get to this awesome level, but it helps to know that other people do struggle at the same time. So I hope this was helpful to you. I think I think that's been it, one of the fun things about getting to collaborate with other content creators and other people in the industry is meeting them in real life, and it's always interesting to see how much shorter everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> always, um, it's it's really interesting to see who you know is very much like their uh, persona on social media. And who's very different in real life mm-hmm. from what they show in social media. Even and what they look like. They even look some, different. Yeah. We've met a few people that like post using heavy filters all the time. And when you meet them in person, you're like, wow, you don't even <laughs> look like you. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think most people are are pretty genuine. Um, and sometimes it's the people, I think, who have the m- the most to hide who sometimes post the most perfection, like yeah. that, that spend the most time really cultivating this, this persona and this appearance online that is really very different from who they actually are. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we can always just speculate who that might be, but it's fun to think about. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know. And if you are struggling with pain or a back injury or joint injury, chronic pain, uh, hypermobility, then we have some really great programs. Limitless. Limitless is geared toward anyone in pain. Hypermobility. Anyone that wants to learn the intricacies of movement. Yeah, the movement, the coaching, the type of method that we use. We do have a lot of professionals that go through our programs as well just to increase their own knowledge and help themselves as coaches um, or physical therapists, massage therapists. We are therapists. planning on getting that you know, CU credits at some point here. That we, I, yeah. We've been in program building mode for a couple of years, and I'm like, I need to stop making things because it really runs me into the ground every time I make stuff. But some people have... Um, Purchased the program, completed it. We give you, we can give you a cert- certificate of completion, and then they're able to go to the governing body and get CEUs from that. They just have to write up a, a little paragraph, I think, about what is in the program. Um, so that could be an option for you as well if you are a professional. But so we have the Limitless program. Then we have the hypermobility program that is geared specifically to anyone who is hypermobile or has, you know, hypermobile EDS, joint hypermobility syndrome, or if you are a professional who works with people who are hypermobile, which is about 20% of the population, then you would definitely benefit Mm -hmm. from that program. We also have a strength and conditioning program that can be purchased as a bundle with any with either of our other programs or can be purchased on its own. If you have no pain and you just want to get jacked. Kind of follow the workouts that that I do, essentially. That's that's what it is. Strength and conditioning is the program for you. And I've made it so that um, (laughs) it can be like I didn't even do it at the level that I wrote it at. So I always write it for like someone who's a little bit more 
intense than I would be. You know, I was never like the most intense athlete. And so just kind of thinking about those people in my mind and what they would do to train, I wrote it that way. And it's scalable anywhere. From, I mean, we've got 60, 70 year olds in there doing the program. And then we also have some pretty like elite athletes that have gone through it. So nice spectrum there for, for anyone. Some people don't even really use much weight and it works great. Yeah. Yeah, it's very easily modifiable and appropriate for any level of fitness, whether you are beginner or advanced. There are videos um, going over every exercise, to going over technique and form. Um, we pay a lot of attention to that in all of our programs. We believe that's very important. You can follow us on Instagram at wealth. That's spelled W health. We are on TikTok at W health underscore. Our website is www.spreadwealth.com. Andrew is at the dot shirtless dude. I am at cater tot. I think that's all of them. We're on YouTube. What's that? We're on YouTube. Yeah. I don't know what it YouTube. is. Spread it's, wealth? It's got like 600 subscribers. No, I think it's wealth. I think it's spread wealth. I don't know. It could be wealth. I post videos there sometimes. The same ones we post to the other platforms. We'll be posting this there so you can watch us. And if you have any feedback for this podcast, this is the first one that I have recorded solo and I'll be mastering and producing. It may be totally trash. We'll find out. I did notice that this bar is much higher when I'm talking versus when you're talking. So we'll see how always. the audio is. Um, I always need to be louder. Always be louder. So we'll, we'll see how that is. But thank you very much for listening. And I hope that was helpful to you. Bye. Take care, everybody. How do I stop it? <laughs> <laughs>